This is the Reluctant Leader Podcast, the podcast designed to help you if you've landed a leadership role through no fault of your own and now need to find out what you should be doing. I'm your host, Mark Terrell, and have been there and know what it feels like and made all the mistakes. In each episode, I'll be getting to grips with a leadership topic by interviewing an expert in their field. You'll find out why they do what they do and take away some top tips you can use to become a more confident leader. For more content and to keep in touch with how the project is developing, go to www.thereluctantleader.co.uk. If you have any comments about the episode, you'll find me on LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter. So let's crack on with the show. Today I'm talking to Dee Clayton. Dee is passionate about working with senior managers, executives and their teams. She offers management and presentation skills training and has won many business awards in recognition of her innovative and effective training approach. Last year, she won silver in the Influential Business Woman of the Year 2018, National Business Women's Awards, and previously achieved Business Person of the Year for two consecutive years at the East of England Business Champions Awards. Dee and her trusted partners help professionals who suffer from public speaking fears using her unique and multi-award winning public speaking monkeys approach. They also help good presenters to become great. Dee frequently works with European participants and has run training courses across four continents. Prior to setting up Simply Amazing Training, she worked in a wide variety of products in different company settings. Her experience took her from Jacobs Creek to Jammy Dodgers. Bernard Matthews to Boddington's and Marigold's to Murphy's, allowing her to develop expertise across many communication tools, including TV advertising, international event sponsorship and conferences. Dee is the author of the book Taming Your Public Speaking Monkeys, Building Confidence for Public Speaking and Presentations and High Performance Presentations, Public Speaking Tips and Presentation Skills to Engage, Persuade and Inspire. I hope you enjoy this chat we had about presenting and I'll catch you all on the other side. Dee, welcome to the Reluctant Leader podcast. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me along. I uh, invited you because I was lucky enough to read your book, which I downloaded from um, Amazon, as we do these days. Um, and I-, I thought it was fantastic, to be honest. I thought it was just what everyone needs to know about if they're standing up in front of somebody to present to them in many ways. Obviously, there's, we'll cover what those situations are. But I just think we need a structure. And within the book, it was, it was just some, something that shouted at me that I needed to get you on the podcast. So I'm, I'm really pleased that you um, took me up on my offer. And here we are. Excellent. Uh, bef- Thank you. So before we get stuck into that... Um, before we do that, uh, what I do is ask all my guests, um, all my guests, uh, why the, what, what, why do they do what they do, and what was that pivotal moment that took you down this path? Sure. Well, the reason I do what I do is that I love helping others, and I love seeing the difference that it makes. And literally, right in front of your eyes, you can see people change. So that is absolutely the reward for me. Um, and it hasn't always been like that. I came from a marketing background, so I used to work with Jamie Dodgers, Jacobs Creek, Boddington's Beer, so lots of food and drink. Uh, lucky this is uh, not a video podcast. No, I, um, and that's my background, food and drink marketing. But you can't see the results, and then you think, well, what results are you getting? Are you getting people to drink more and eat more? Is that exactly going to make a difference in the world? Probably not in the right direction. So it's all about helping people to make a difference in the right direction. And that's really what motivated me. Uh, in terms of kind of like what, what made me switch that way, well, I think for many people, there's kind of like a big life incident. I had a, a car accident, which I would like to say wasn't my fault. Somebody went into the back of me. And um, that caused me quite a lot of um, pain and uh, really to evaluate things over the next couple of years. And I had a little bit of compensation money, which I decided I didn't want to just waste on a holiday. I wanted it to change my life. And I then used that money to invest in personal coaching, personal development and growing myself and building my confidence and skill sets so that I could do something different. And I didn't really know what that was at the time. But over time, as you start to work on these things, things tend to emerge. And I thought, okay, I want to do something differently. And, uh, and here I am. 
Mm. Wow, that's uh, quite a story, isn't it? And um, obviously, that's a major pivotal moment that you probably at the time didn't think was, well, I suppose you were thinking it's all bad and it's obviously not um, going to be great, but you've turned uh, something bad into something that's really good, which is um, Yeah, and I think, great. yeah, that's what that's what happens with many people, isn't it? I think sometimes it takes something bad for you to realise that mm. things need to change. So I wouldn't wish it upon anyone. But equally, I wouldn't change it at all because if that hadn't happened, I don't know that I'd be doing what I am now. So, um, mm. so I'm grateful for it, actually. Yeah. 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 Great stuff. Okay. Doke. So we are going to be talking about presenting today. Um, and I think before we go down into getting to the nitty gritty, um, probably best to sum up um, those situations where it's really useful to have some presentation skills. There are many, but um, what, where, what are the typical ones that you you come across that people are asking your help for with? Yeah, well, there's there's the obvious ones that people know are presentations, things like presenting at conferences, doing sales pitches, speaking to your team in front of the team, sort of a monthly meeting or an all-hands presentation. So things where there's a PowerPoint and a deck and a set of slides, they're the obvious presentations. But the thing that I think most people don't realise is that they present almost all of the time. So even what we're doing now, although it's a you know it's a, a, a webinar or a conference call, it's still presenting. If you're having a meeting with your boss and you're talking about your career progression, you're presenting yourself. If you're meeting people from the American head office, you're still presenting yourself. So although it's not an official presentation, actually we present pretty much all the time. And unless we're talking to ourselves in front of the mirror, then that doesn't count. But anytime there's someone else present, I'd say that's pretty much presenting. Right, yes. As I can remember having a conversation with somebody once and they said, um, if you imagine that the amount of CCTV cameras there are around, um, if you think yourself you're already always sort of on show, whether it's people <laughs> actually watching you or a camera, that's probably much that's probably the case, isn't it, in the in this day and age? Yeah, that's a bit scary. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But I mentioned the big V word, the video word, and um and we know that video is becoming more and more important when we come to present, uh, we're not presenting, but really to um, get our message out there. Uh, and, and obviously presenting yourself on video is, is, is so much, it's, it's so important, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think there's another layer of problems when it comes to videoing yourself or others. So there's the kind of presentation skills that I talk about, but then there's a second level of mindset issues where you get people don't like being videoed there's a permanence about it it can be rewatched. whereas if you're just presenting you can kind of hopefully people might forget so there's a whole nother layer when it comes to video on top so you need to be good at presentations and also you need to learn some other skills as well yeah that permanent thing is really important is it because um once it's out in social media it's uh, pretty difficult to um recapture it and bring it back back to home isn't it Yes, indeed. <laughs> Although having said that, you know, with so many people vying for attention, it probably isn't going to get as many views as you think it might, but that's probably not the reason to uh, to not do it. But I think it's really interesting with video because you talk to a lot of people, they don't even like having their photo taken, you know, just don't show me that picture because I, d I don't look this or I don't look that. You're like, but I can see your face all the time. So you're not yeah. hiding your face from me, but as soon as it becomes a picture, there's something about that permanence, isn't there? Yeah, that, that's interesting, isn't it? Because uh, I know when I started doing these podcasts, the one thing I have to do is listen to them back. And um, I'm sure you you get this as well, where people actually don't really like their own voice or don't like listening to their own voice. Yes, that's quite common, yeah. And because we hear our voice very differently, so we hear our own voice inside our head. Whereas as you're hearing my voice, which is reality for you, it's come out of my head and it's being bounced around all the other things. So the voice that I hear is totally different to my real voice that you hear and the one that's on this video recording or, or audio. So, yeah, it's totally different. And that's because we're not used to that voice because we don't hear it all the time. We hear the voice that's inside our head, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure people um, will relate to that. Um, it's not. I think it'd be worth just mentioning the what's quoted quite often when it comes to presenting or standing in front of people that um, it's quoted that. No, it, you're it, not it, even going to say this, are you? I, no, I, I, no. Am. I think it needs to be addressed because <laughs> I think you need to say it. Is oh, that no. people um, treat <laughs> presenting or standing up in people or speaking in front of people? It's more of a dread than actually dying. 
Um, so what's, what's your take on that? Well, uh, uh, you won't find that quoted in any of my literature, any of my books or any of my blogs. Uh, I think that people use that as a bit of a scaremongering tool to get people to take action. But people are scared enough of presenting. I don't think they need any kind of uh, exaggeration of it. I think it's probably yeah. quite a funny quote, but I, I try not to use it really because I don't want to make <laughs> presenting any worse than people already think it is. So I try and take a more positive approach to um, to getting people to feel better about public speaking rather than perpetuating uh, the, ter- the terrifyingness of it. If terrifyingness yes. is a word, I'm not sure. That myth um, that, uh, that is bounded about, yes. So I think that's a great way to lead in on first thing that I've got noted down to talk about is mindset. It's uh, it's coming into this uh, in this with that, that the right mindset, uh, and I'm sure you've got um, uh, plenty to say about how you'd go about that. Yeah, and and most people come to public speaking with a negative mindset. Not everybody, but. Let's assume most people. And where this really comes from is a very young age, certainly in the school system I went to and the ones that I work with and my clients. School is a place uh, where, not just school, but, but when you're younger, society is about learning what's right and what's wrong. And there's no sort of uh, continual improvement idea. It's either you did well in your test, you either passed or you failed. And the same with things like reading out loud, which many people don't realise is their first experience of public speaking. Because often, I don't know about nowadays, but in my day, when I went to school, you know, people would say, well, stand up and read out loud. Well, the reason you're reading out loud is not because you're so good at it, it's because you're probably going to get something wrong. So you might say you stand up, all of your classmates are looking at you. And you might say something like chef instead of chief because you've misread it. And, of course, what are all your classmates going to do? They're going to laugh at you, right? And that's your first experience, possibly, of public speaking, standing up, doing something wrong and people laughing at you. And that young age, it's a a really big deal, even though it may not seem it now as an adult looking back. It really is a big deal when you're younger for many people. Yeah, you're so right, and and it's it is those things that stick in our mind. Maybe not, maybe consciously, but subconsciously, that when something that is um, not a great memory, and it's and there's an association with that, then automatically we're going in and into it with the wrong mindset, or or something's triggered within us to think actually this is it's a danger here. You know, something bad's going to happen, and then of course we're we're not in the right place to actually do it properly or in the right way well absolutely and you mentioned unconscious and this is where the mindset is in your unconscious mind so consciously people are like well I didn't have that problem at school or sometimes I work with clients and they say no no nothing like that happened with me it might be at home it doesn't have to be at school it's just an easy place to kind of to pick up some of these what I call public speaking monkeys but it could be at home I had one very um, unusual incident actually where we were really looking around for the source of this this negative mindset and usually we get to it you know with a little bit of work we get to it relatively easy and with this particular individual we were just struggling to get to where this came from you know perfect upbringing perfect school life and couldn't find it and then eventually he said you know well there is one thing he said my my brother uh, is deaf and at the school at the, at the dinner table you know, at home at the dinner table, he used to get told that the person I was talking to used to get told is not your turn to talk. Because of course, with a deaf uh, member of the family, you had to be, know who was speaking at the right time. You can't just talk all over each other. So that wasn't particularly a negative experience is not your turn to talk. But he took that belief with him throughout his life and never really felt it was his time to talk. And if you know a bit about introversion and extroversion, you know with extroverts, it might never be your time to talk. So. <laughs> yes. That's interesting. It's, it's almost like retraining what is something that um, you've been taught. As, as it's, um, I suppose it's a bit like not speaking to strangers. You're taught that, told that when you're young, but actually when you're older and you're you know, in the business environment and networking, the one thing you do have to do is actually <laughs> make sure you speak to strangers, isn't it? Do speak to strangers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you have to reprogram and you don't realise all that stuff is in your brain about about that from, from a young age. So if it's helpful, then keep it. But yes, a lot of the time, the beliefs that I work with people with are outdated or over-exaggerated. Mm. 
Yes. Okie dokie. Um, so you've, you've touched on the introverted, extroverted thing. And I think the next thing really is to talk about our own personal style, which um, I, I guess we all go into things the way we perceive the best way to do things and according to our um, natural style. But uh, and, and I, I, I guess with that, there comes natural strength but also sort of weaknesses that naturally come out that we obviously got to uh, make sure that we don't make um too much of a you know uh, of, of a um, mistake with yes and i talk about four or five presenter personality styles and i'll talk about the fifth one first if you like and the you know which is the monkey style which isn't really a style it's exactly what i was talking about before having so many little public speaking monkeys in your mind that you're actually almost o- overshadowing any other style that you might be because you're just worried about speaking. You don't look, want to look stupid. You don't think you're good enough. So there's all sorts of behaviours that come out. And I talk about that a lot in my first book about taming your public speaking monkeys. So there's the monkey style. But let's assume then you haven't got the monkey style or you've done some work to overcome your monkey style or you're not scared of presenting, then I think the presenter personality styles you're talking about, these four types, there's Mm. results, sociable, caring, and information as I talk about them. Mm. And they're really based on people's personality styles and, as you say, their strengths and weaknesses with those. So if you have a look at the results, preference styles, they're going to be the kind of people that are speaking quite quickly, want to get through the information really far, and they're very direct. They just say, go and do this, which is good. Everybody knows what's required. But you might say, well, hold on, I didn't really understand what was going on. You went too quickly and I wasn't bought in to what you were saying. You've probably heard some of those styles yourself, haven't you? Yeah, I'm sure. yes, absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're left behind. You're almost exhausted after they finish talking and uh, yeah. someone else often mops up that mess. Um, so good, good and bad to all of the styles. Mm-hmm. The sociable style is kind of enthusiastic. Come on, this is going to be great. This is the best in, in initiative ever. It's going to change the world. So they're positive. They're enthusiastic. You want one of those leading the charge if you're coming up with new change. But of course, on the downside, they're not going to have necessarily thought through the details. So when you get other styles saying, well, what, how exactly is it going to work? And when is the time scale and how are we going to measure it? It's like, oh, well, don't worry about that. Uh, you may know some politicians a little bit like that, perhaps. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Moving on. So the caring style is uh, more introverted preference. So definitely a bit more reflective and a bit more caring and thoughtful. And it's all about the relationships. So when they present, they would have thought through all of the implications from the people side of things. Um, but sometimes because they're so busy thinking through all, all of the consequences, they can come across as a bit slow for some of the faster types. So, you know, they're not going to go too quickly, but some of the faster types might be going, well, come on, you know, where's, where's the action? Let's move on. It's not going quick enough here. So they might need to work on, on speeding up a little bit. And then the uh, final, final type is that information type. So lots of facts and figures. You might say if you're going to generalize somebody in finance or IT and they've got all of the details and they know the answers to all the questions, but they maybe lack some presence about them when they deliver the information. So it's all a bit uh, monotone perhaps because they haven't got a story behind what they're saying. And a lot of what I teach them is to bring in a story behind the facts and figures, maybe to illustrate it, show a visual instead of just a whole spreadsheet and recognize that not everyone needs that amount of detail sometimes to leave it in the appendix and only answer if you're asked a question so hopefully uh that gives a bit of an overview to those four yeah that's, that's really useful and obviously i'm sure we've all had uh, experiences of listening to all those four types and and i think it's useful to think about well which one are you naturally i know which one i am um <laughs> and it's and i know uh, what I need to be careful about and, and not do too much of. And, it, and we, what we need to think about, not only ourselves, but we've got to think about our audience, haven't we? We've got to think about what do our audience want and what are they likely to be made up of? What, you know, what's the makeup of the audience? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So, so firstly, I guess for your own style, you're not going to just be one style. You're going to have a preference for that one. And you are all of the four styles mixed up, but you're going to have one or two that really are your preference and your go-to preferred styles. And you're right. If you've got good awareness, then you know that you need to 
you know, change it up a bit and include some of the other energies in your presentation. So if you know that you're a bit too big picture, you might need to work on getting the detail in. So, so it's really important to know we're, we're all of the styles, but we tend to have a preference for one or two, especially when the chips are down and we need to just crack right. on and do it. We maybe forget some of the other elements that we've got to our personality. But you're absolutely right that the, the really important thing is to then, after we have our own realisation about our self-awareness, to understand who our audience is. And if it's a one-to-one -one audience, then it's kind of a bit easier to suss out what they need and to adapt to their style. But of course, if you aren't thinking about your audience, you're going to do your own style and assume, as I did when I was younger, that everybody is uh, exactly like me. And of course, they need information in the way I'm, I'm telling them. And that's all fine. Yeah, don't bother adapting. So yeah, you're right. It's about thinking about the audience and tailoring your message to them. Yeah. And I, 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 um, one of the things that I note um, when I'm communicating with someone uh, to get to where the, I need to be to get uh, into rapport is to look how uh, their, um, their emails and how much detail there is. So if they're, you know, there's lots of detail in, in the, in the email, then it's good to, to mirror that, isn't it? If you want to get on the terms where they're actually understanding, I know it's not presenting as such, but it's, a, it's another way of, using that information to you know to to understand one another better absolutely so if it's uh, and you know not just the amount of information but you know whether they start with hi how are you did you have a nice weekend yes. you know if they're kind of a bit more of the sociable or the caring styles versus the results and information styles are probably just going to go hello please, can you have this to me by then? Uh, you know, and, and some people see that as rude, but it's not rude. It's just their style. But it, And when that comes across in speech as well, they can say, well, the way they spoke to me was just rude. It's like, mm, it wasn't rude. It, you may perceive it as rude, but actually it's just a different style. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's a good way of looking at it. And, and what about uh, body language? How does that fit in with um, with this? Well, I think that's an interesting question because... There's lots of people that learn body language per se. And I kind of have a, a belief around that in that if your monkeys are causing you a problem, you're going to show the negative body language. So just going to an acting class or just going to a, a training to learn how to have good body language isn't really going to actually resolve the issue because you'll just know now that you shouldn't be doing that pen clicking or that annoying habit of jangling the change in your pocket. But you're not actually going to stop doing it because your monkeys are still going to be saying you're not good enough, you're stupid, everyone's laughing at you, whatever your stuff is. So I always say the first place to start is mindset. But having said that, there are some ways that you can calm your mind so that you can then calm your body. So generally it's a good idea to have slower body language um, that, that gives you a sort of higher status or higher gravitas than a faster body language. So in my book, I talk about the king and gesture. If you picture how a king moves or a queen, but a king would move slowly, they would be upright, they would speak slowly and they would have that gravitas. Whereas gesture would be jumping around, arms everywhere. Hello, you know, this is great fun. And you might start laughing, but is that unless you're a stand-up comedian, that might not be the outcome that you want when you stand at the front of the room. So big yeah. picture, think about King and Jester. Yes. I, I remember the first time I ever spoke, it was a, a fairly small networking uh, meeting. And afterwards, uh, somebody came up to me and gave me a bit of feedback. And he said, uh, I, I like what you say, and it was I really enjoyed it. But one thing I need to tell you is that you need to stop stepping from one foot to the other I felt a bit mm -hmm. seasick by the end of the 20 minutes. <laughs> I said, <laughs> Thanks for that feedback. But it was, it was valuable. And I obviously had to be more aware of that I was doing that. And obviously that can become distracting, can't it? If you're trying and to get did a message. it stop you doing it? Um, I, I, I'm conscious of it when I stand up now that I don't do mm -hmm. it because obviously it's a natural thing that I sort of sway back and forward. I think that's what he was telling mm -hmm. me. But um, whether I've stopped doing it is a is question questionable. But um, I'm yeah, because that's the whole don't think of a blue tree, isn't it? Don't do that. Don't do the other. <laughs> so again, one of the things I would obviously he wasn't trained in um, giving feedback from a professional point of view. But one yeah. of the things that is important when you are giving people feedback, it's great to give feedback, and I think that's wonderful that. Uh, it's actually quite a gift and quite brave that, that they gave you feedback. The, the way to give feedback in a more effective way is to say what you do want. So rather than say, stop swaying around, you made me seasick, 
perhaps a better approach would be to say what I did want you to do. So, you know, it'd be great if you could just stand really still so that I can focus on your message and you can just feel, you know, grounded and feel like your feet are stuck to the floor. That mm -hmm. way I can really concentrate on what you're saying. Might be uh, a better, more effective way because, and maybe if you didn't have that many nerves, it's okay to be that direct with you. But for many people with nerves already, the last thing they need to know is that, oh no, on top of everything else, now I'm swaying around like a boat, you know, making everyone sick. Yeah, That, yeah. that might not help everybody. So, I mean, it goes with uh, the territory and that, that we as a species are much better to uh, noticing things that are wrong than the, the things that are right. And and that's where we, the perspective we come from mostly, isn't it? Like, so that's a typical sort of reaction that I had there, but actually a more measured way would be exactly as you described was, you know, actually if you stood still, uh, I think think your message would be even even better uh, rather than mm. thinking about the, um, the swaying back and forth thing yeah Excellent. but we all do everyone does it i know <laughs> <laughs> indeed um so um something that i noticed in your book um you you talk about the sas um mm -hmm. obviously not the special air service but something <laughs> else that you, you you've come up with that's which is um a process so i think it's probably worth um, sharing what um simply amazing structure you've, you've come up with Sure, yeah. And what I found was that people aren't really taught how to structure not just presentations, but any communications. And again, you know, maybe don't get me onto this, but, you know, if only we learned this stuff in schools about how to structure a, a good piece of communication. So the, the SAS, when you learn it, can apply to presentations. And that's why we've developed it. But Equally, it can apply to emails, important phone calls, appraisals, videos. You know, you can apply it to anything. And it's just a very simple structure that if you go through that structure, you will make sure that you hit everyone's needs and it will actually uh, help you to hit the audience styles as well. And there's four, there's a few parts to it, but let's just cover the four key parts, which is the a little introduction at the beginning, just saying what the presentation is about, but then moving on to the why and the question is, why should the audience, you know, if I'm an audience member, why would I listen to you? And all of these questions are from the audience's perspective, not from your own. Not why am I telling you how great I am, but why would you benefit from what I'm going to say? You know, what are the benefits for you? Are you going to get better rapport, increase your, ta uh, increase your time savings, increase your margins? You know, what are the what are, what are the benefits? And for those in sales, that's kind of like the with them, what's in it for me? Hmm. So that's the first part, the why section. And many people forget to do the why. So they just start presenting and you're sitting there going, I'm not sure why I need to spend another hour listening to this because <laughs> I don't know how it's relevant to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Then the next section is the what section. And that's kind of what information as an audience member, what information do I need to know? And, it's not, again, it's not what do you want to tell me, it's what do I need to know. And so, you know, the power of threes, we break that into three sections. And that might be a very typical structure for that is the beginning, the middle and an end or before, during and after. So before, you might be talking about the problems with why people need presentation skills training because people haven't got this skill set or they keep on losing pitches or they going into customers and they're displaying unconfident body language and then you might talk about the during so you might say so during the public speaking training this is how it will work this is how the courses look and this is how the one-to-one -one coaches work and then the after which is yes yeah, so once we've worked with you these are the results you can expect now we might not know what you can achieve but we could show you for example the future uh like for other clients other clients just like you, they've got this result, that result, they've improved their conversion rates, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So you can talk about your story, the before, the during, and the after, or the problem, the solution, and a case study or testimonial. And that's often the structure of the what. It's a bit more complicated than that, but that's yeah. kind of the overview. And then the next section is the how section. And actually, when it comes to preparing the presentation, we want to do the how section before the what section so that we know what to put in the what. And the how section is so often missed by people. It's how do you take action now? As an audience member, how do I take action? So in here, you're literally, whether directly or indirectly, but you're asking for what you want. So you might say, so you know, sign up to this newsletter, buy this product 
take a pilot with us, come and meet us for coffee, whatever your action is from the presentation, buy this book, for example. And you, you need to ask for what you want. You, you might need to do it subtly. You might need to build up to it. You might not want to go straight out there and say it because you might break rapport. You've been talking about rapport earlier. But you still do need to ask, and I find a lot of personality styles, you know, especially caring personality style, they really don't like closing people, if you want to call it that. And they feel a bit reluctant to ask, and they just kind of assume that you understand what needs to happen next. And for many, many styles, we don't assume, we don't know, so we won't action unless you kind of really uh, hold hold our hand and take us through it. Mm -hmm. And then the final section is, the what if question where the audience get to ask well yes i understand all that but what if i want it in red or what if i want to have it in australia or what if so it's that opportunity for the audience to ask questions now they should have asked understanding questions throughout and that should be interactive if you're confident enough to allow that to happen but at the end they're kind of any open questions and the benefit of literally opening it up to any questions at all not just this but anything at all that we're working on that you want to ask me about, that's great because it opens up loads of new opportunities potentially for understanding objections that are going on in other parts of the business or other departments. Or if you're in sales, it opens up lots more sales opportunities because they go, oh, we are doing this other thing. Can you help with that? So most people, if they've got monkeys or are a bit nervous about presenting, really hate the questions part because they worry they're going to get asked a question they don't know. But Actually, this is one of the best parts and one of the most rewarding sections because you really get to check that they understand your message and you get to deal with objections right there in the room, which is the best place to deal with them. Mm, brilliant. Great stuff. Uh, well, sadly, sadly, uh, time has run out on us um, and it's come to the point where I'm going to ask you for some top tips, which I ask everybody for. So hopefully you're prepared for this. I'm sure you are. Um, so what would be those three top tips to, to, to um, take from what we've been talking about and the things that you do that somebody that's listening today can actually action uh, when they're next and needing to present in some way? Sure. Uh, so my first one would be to be yourself, to free yourself. So making sure that you can be yourself instead of being held hostage by your public speaking monkeys. And that way you can just be yourself. And obviously that person is good enough to have that job role. Otherwise you wouldn't be doing it. So be yourself to free yourself. The second tip would really be once you have freed yourself and you can be yourself, then realizing that it's not to do with you at all. It's all about the audience. So it's not about you. It's about the audience. Make sure you research the audience, you understand what they need, you go through the SAS structure, and you understand their styles and adapt your style to fit with the audience to get the best result. And the third tip then would be around structuring and preparing your presentation, a little bit like Goldilocks and Three Bears. You don't want to under-prepare and, and just do it off the cuff. You don't want to over-prepare and make it a bit stale and boring and uh, want to keep it to a script. By using the SAS structure, you can prepare just about the right amount so that you know what you're going to say, but you're also free to go off at little sidetracks. If you need to go off piste, you can, but you can come back onto track and always know where you are in your presentation. So I think those would be my top tips. Fantastic. Thank you for your time today. I know you're very busy. Um, we've taken a, a little while to get this in the diary, but I've really enjoyed it. I hope you have too. Yeah, thank you very much for asking me. That's great. And um, dare I say it, it's been simply amazing. <laughs> Lovely talking to you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, please take a moment to leave a review. Don't forget to check out The Reluctant Leader Project at www.thereluctantleader.co.uk. Make a note to start, stop or continue doing whatever struck a chord in this episode. And until next time, be the best you can be.